Uh, today we're happy to have Dr. Massey with us presenting in bioterrorism. Uh, Dr. Massey is a professor of medicine and preventative medicine at the Icon School of Medicine here on Mount Sinai. He's also on the faculty of the Mount Sinai Master's of Public Health Program. Dr. Massey earned his medical degree from the New York University School of Medicine, after which he completed his residency in internal medicine at Boston City Hospital and his fellowship in infectious disease at Mount Sinai. <laughs> He joined the faculty at Elmhurst Hospital in 1982, where he founded the hospital's AIDS program in 1986. He became Associate Director of Medicine at Elmhurst Hospital in 1987 and rose to the position of Director of the Department of Medicine in 2002. Dr. Massey has been extensively involved in the design of services for HIV and AIDS patients in New York City, serving on the medical care criteria at the New York State AIDS Institute from 1999 to 2013. He also serves as a clinical co-chairman of the HHC HIV Directors Council and is a member of the New York City Commission on AIDS. Since 2014, Dr. Massey has served as program director and technical lead for two federally funded projects focused on HIV and TB care in Ethiopia and in Russia. Since the, 20, uh, since the uh, September 11 attacks, Dr. Massey has also been extensively involved in bioterrorism and emergency preparedness planning for New York. From 2001 to 2010, he was the chairman of the HHC Emergency Preparedness Council and was the advisor on bioterrorism to its president. Since September 11, he has served as a member of the Bioterrorism Task Force of New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. He's also the co-author of the textbook Bioterrorism, A Guide for Hospital Preparedness. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Massey. Thank you. Happy Election Day. Um, so we're going to talk about bioterrorism, and uh, I think one thing that is um, somewhat surprising is there really has not been a bioterrorist attack uh, since the attack that occurred right after the 9-11 um, bombing of the World Trade Center. And I think if you had told us at that time that there weren't going to be any further attacks in 15 years, nobody would have believed you. I, I was an infectious disease specialist up until then with no background, no knowledge about bioterrorism threats. And immediately, the, this became a major initiative and, and a priority for New York City, for the state, for the country. So a lot of people were drawn together to look at bioterrorism historically, figure out what we would do to prevent it and respond to it if it did happen again. And so far, it hasn't. So what you see here, of course, that's the World Trade Center going down on 9-11. And the uh, slide up until the upper left there is the um, uh, anthrax bacillus. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. And then these are letters that came out co very coincidentally, it appears, um, shortly after the 9-11 attacks that contained highly uh, infectious spores of anthrax bacillus. Uh, what that connection, if any, was to the 9-11 attacks has never been sorted out, never been clarified, and no one really even claims that there is a connection. But as you can see, the date of that letter on the right is 9-11. So, that attack, the anthrax attack, um, began shortly after 9-11. The, the first letters were received a few days later. And it went out to about the end of October that year. There were a total of 23 cases, uh, about half inhalational, half cutaneous anthrax cases, almost all of which were traceable to highly contagious anthrax spores which had been delivered through the mail, including to some famous people, Tom Brokaw, Tom Daschle, et cetera. And then it stopped. So these are the cases that occurred during that attack. There were 11 inhalational cases. That's the highly lethal version of anthrax uh, occurring in Florida, New York, District of Columbia, and Connecticut. There was a documented exposure to this contaminated male in nine of those cases. The exposure was unknown in two of the cases. There were six survivors, and there were five fatalities. Now, the reason why this was so striking is that anthrax was and continues to be almost unheard of in this country. Occasionally we hear cases usually related to skins or drums being brought in from other countries. That's a solitary case. It gets investigated years ago by and then there's another case. This cluster of cases was completely unheard of and unprecedented in our country. The cutaneous cases, of which there were 12, there was a known or suspected exposure to contaminated mail in 11 of those. The other one was a lab tech who was working with the environmental version of anthrax in Texas. There were no deaths, but on the, on the basis of that attack, um, the shelves were cleared nationally of ciprofloxacin, which was rapidly uh, regarded and publicized as the treatment for anthrax.
78,000 doses were prescribed by um, February uh, of 2002, and many more were just uh, taken without prescription. And these were the headlines. Now we see some familiarity, and I'll show you some headlines that came with Ebola and with Zika. The explosion of headlines was quite frightening with anthrax because it happened, in part because it happened right after the 9-11 attacks. So it looked as though this was a coordinated attack on multiple fronts using multiple different techniques of attack, and it was unfolding in front of us. Uh, so you see some of the headlines here, and you see newspapers there. Um, the Senate uh, office building, the hard office building, remained closed because of contamination with anthrax spores from the letters for about five years after the attack. And a lot of things were done to detect anthrax spores and environmental sources after this. A lot was written about how we should respond to future threats and attacks. Uh, they dusted off uh, some old uh, strategy pictures like this, what a crop duster that was carrying 100 uh, kilograms of anthrax spores could do if it flew, flew over Washington. Depending on the weather, you see a variety of different outcomes. The worst was uh, on a calm, clear night, 1 million to 3 million deaths from disseminating anthrax spores. And that was uh, on the order of magnitude of what a hydrogen bomb would do to Washington, D.C. So this is what we were confronting in late 2001. Okay, nobody knew where these anthrax spores had come from, why they were released, whether it had anything to do with the 9-11 attacks, but we knew how dangerous it would be. So these mysteries, uh, for a while some of this seemed to be solved, now it seems to be as open to question as it ever was, who the perpetrator was. It was a physician who worked at USAMRID, uh, the military infectious disease um, uh, laboratory, uh, Bruce Ivins, who was uh, thought to be the perpetrator behind this. He committed suicide in 2008 under the uh, burden of that investigation. And over the last few years, there have been uh, significant doubts raised as to his actual responsibility for any of it. What the motive was has never been clarified. Where the letters were actually mailed from has never been sorted out. Whether it was related to the 9-11 attack, that has now been um, revisited as a possibility since it's uh, not clear what Ivan's role in any of it was. Why it started when it did, first letter dated September 11th, and why it stopped. So this was followed by the literature. The medical literature is steady in many areas and it's very explosive in some areas. So you see here, I'll show you a graph in a second of this. In 2000, before the 9-11 attacks, there were 62 citations uh, regarding bioterrorism in Medline. It rose to over 800 by 2002, and this year so far there have been six. So there's this rapid enthusiasm burst and a steady decline after that. And many of the articles in the last few years have been review articles or historical articles. And that is kind of surprising given the Ebola and Zika outbreaks that there was no potential connection to bioterrorism, but there hasn't been. So that's the graph. So almost nothing in 2000 and back to almost nothing now. And when you look at this graph, I think there's a, there's a basis to be concerned. If there was so much enthusiasm, so much uncertainty that everybody was writing about bioterrorism, do we really know a lot more about it now to justify nobody really looking very closely at it, in the medical literature at least? So what do we know about bioterrorism? Well, so these are some simple points. If you compare it to chemical terrorism, it's got certain advantages. It's more insidious, for example. You'll see in some of the common infectious pathogens that are spoken of in bioterrorist dialogue, you, you understand that there are secondary, tertiary, exploding cases after an initial release. That's something you don't see with a chemical attack. There are more potential casualties. Chemical attacks are geographically restricted, where biological attacks could be worldwide. Uh, can be harder to detect, can be impossible to trace to its origin. Uh, it can be easier to disperse. This could be a very amateur uh, effort, really, compared to a chemical attack, which would require sophisticated means of uh, dispersing it. Compared to nuclear terrorism, dirty bombs, we hear about sometimes where someone with a uh, suitcase that's covered with radioactive material explodes it in lower Manhattan. Um, that's not happened, and if it were to happen, as traumatic and as frightening as that would be, it would probably carry far lower risk than a biological attack would. It would be a regional risk. Uh, nuclear reactors, which we're often uh, told to be concerned about, are relatively impregnable, and there's been no attack on a nuclear reactor to release radiation into the environment. Other possible points of attack, the water supply, unlikely. 
um, because of the dilutional effect. So only water supplies within very confined areas might be open to attack, either chemical or biological. But the food supply is of grave concern. And that's, someone was asking about this or mentioning the salmonella attack in um, uh, Washington State that occurred in the 1980s where salmonella was put into salad bars and some patients got sick from that. That is the kind of attack which is more plausible, but has only happened that one time as far as we know. So the CDC has long lists of potential agents of biological attack. The category A agents are the ones you see here. There's also a category B and a category C, and these are ranked according to their destructive potential and according to their ability to be disseminated throughout a population. So the big three are smallpox, uh, anthrax, and plague. Botulism is uh, of great concern, but botulism, unlike the other three, uh, is not a cause of tremendous mortality. It's a cause of uh, uh, paralysis, obviously, could potentially cripple the hospital system, but it doesn't sort of rank in terms of visceral reaction with those other three that are capitalized. Tularemia, hemorrhagic fever viruses, Ebola is now no longer considered a hemorrhagic fever virus, but it's still listed that way on this. These are, of course, our potentially um, important agents as well, but smallpox, anthrax, and plague are still the big three. So let's talk briefly about smallpox. When I was a fellow here from 1980 to 1982, smallpox had just been eradicated from the world, but one of the attendings wasn't completely confident that that was true. And we were called to the emergency department here to see a patient with a rash that resembled smallpox. Turns out it wasn't smallpox, uh, but that's how close we are to actually the reality of smallpox. It's not that far in the distant past. Now, it is considered mankind's greatest killer. Conquering smallpox, many would argue, was uh, medicine's greatest victory. It was eradicated from the world in 1977 by a village by village in Africa ring vaccination campaign. Uh, although the last case was in 1977, it took another couple of years for them to confirm that there were no other cases in the world, so 1980 was the cutoff year for it. Uh, it was felt to be the greatest infectious killer of all time. And in the 20th century alone, as its incidence was falling, it was responsible for 500 million cases and 100 million deaths, more than war, AIDS, influenza combined. And that's in a, in a century in which it was eradicated for the last 20 years. Uh, vaccination stopped after 1980. Uh, vaccinating the public was a common practice up until then, no longer. The military is still vaccinated uh, during periods of conflict, at least. Uh, but public vaccination uh, has basically stopped with smallpox. We learned a lot about the smallpox vaccine after the 9-11 attack because it was concerned that smallpox might be the next wave. So smallpox vaccination was ramped up. A lot was uh, manufactured and very little of it ended up getting dispensed because of fear of side effects of the vaccine. So today, nobody in this room is likely to be um, immune to smallpox, unless you were vaccinated really within the last 10 years, and that would really require you to have been in the military. Viral strains were maintained with smallpox at the CDC and in Russia. Uh, it's been known since uh, 3700 BC, the epidemic killed a third of the population of Athens in 430 BC, killed far more people in the Middle Ages than plague ever did. Smallpox did not occur in these uh, sort of well-circumscribed epidemics the way plague did. It was present throughout. Uh, it was um, used against the American uh, uh, Indians uh, by um, settlers, colonists, and the Revolutionary Army. Uh, there were 15 million cases as recently as 1967 worldwide. So it's transmitted by respiratory secretions, by direct contact, by fomites. Um, the uh, attack on uh, Native Americans occurred by distributing blankets that had been contaminated with the virus because they had been used by soldiers who were recovering from smallpox. So fomites, in other words, inanimate objects, are a way of disseminating this virus. It uh, requires a pretty small inoculum for transmission. So typically, 30% of susceptible hosts become infected during an outbreak and 30% of them die. Its average incubation period of 12 days is one of the advantages that smallpox has as a potential agent of biological attack. For the first few days, patient is completely asymptomatic. Toward the end of this 12-day incubation period, they begin to develop nonspecific sy symptoms like fever, muscle aches. Then after three days of that, they th then have the rash. So by the time they're recognized as having smallpox, they've been actually capable of transmitting it for several days. 
And here you see the progression of the rash. This is in a fatal case, day three, five, and seven. Day three, after the infection began, a very little rash on this child. Day seven, you see the rash not only very characteristic, but the, char the distribution is quite characteristic. Unlike chickenpox, as everybody knows, the lesions are all in one generation. They don't appear in various generations where they crust and scab and you get new ones like you do with chickenpox. And the distribution on the body is also quite different. It tends to um, be pr most pronounced on the face and on the distal extremities. Chickenpox is the sort of the uh, mirror image, uh, you know, sort of photographic negative of that, where the, the lesions are primarily on the trunk. So strict isolation or quarantine for 17 days is what's recommended. Laboratory personnel who've handled specimens, who handle specimens have to be protected, like in a level two containment facility, decontamination is needed. And a, any exposed person should be vaccinated within three days. Uh, so this would be quite an undertaking if there was a case in uh, Mount Sinai today, for example. A lot of people would be exposed, a lot of vaccine would have to be ordered, a lot of people would have to have vaccine administered over the next three days to prevent perpetuation of that outbreak. So what's the level of risk? Is the virus available? Probably. Russia and North Korea thought to have stocks. We have stocks. All existing stocks were supposed to be eliminated by December 2002. That plan was canceled after the 9-11 attack. So, the CDC still has viable uh, smallpox. Uh, can it be effectively weaponized? There's no indication that that's been done successfully in modern times, like George Washington with the blankets, uh, but there's no reason to think that couldn't be done again. So in modeling, this is if, a, if an attack was recognized and handled promptly. I won't read through all of this, but the bottom bullet uh, tells what the um, outcome would be. Uh, 4,200 cases, 365 days would be needed to contain, even after a single release, and 9 million doses of the vaccine would be needed. The smallpox vaccine is highly effective, but it only lasts for about 10 years. This is not something we really understood back before it was looked at more closely. It was thought that it really conferred lifelong immunity. It doesn't. With multiple doses, you can uh, get immunity out to 30 years. Requires a specialized needle. Any of you who've gotten a smallpox vaccine, you know it's not just a shot. It's a specialized needle that has to be uh, uh, scraped on, on the skin, this bifurcated needle. Uh, you have to get a successful response to that. You have to get a little rose, ra raised plaque of, uh, of um, induration and vesicles. Uh, it's contraindicated in pregnancy and in immunodeficiency states because it's live virus. So plague. I have very brief information about plague because we're going to come back to plague in the context of one of the exercises that's been done. So plague is caused by a bacteria, and it comes in two versions, pneumonic plague and bubonic plague. Uh, it can be spread by the bite of an infected rat flea. That's typically how bubonic plague starts, where you get the infected buboes draining the area of the uh, insect bite. But then the bacteria can disseminate from those infected lymph nodes everywhere, including to the lungs where it then becomes possible to transmit it to other people through the respiratory route. So it's an unusual step, set of steps in a bifurcated um, route of transmission, bite of an insect and respiratory uh, person to person. So this, the advantage of this one um, is that you can begin an epidemic that that's t then takes on a second wave, a third wave, as progressive respiratory transmission occurs to an expanding population. And one of the exercises, the famous exercise that's been done has demonstrated that. We'll come back to that. So the level of risk, the agent is available, naturally occurring. We hear about plague cases uh, in the southwest, western states every once in a while. Can it be weaponized? Yeah, it's been weaponized by the distribution of infected fleas. That's been done uh, in World War II. And it can also be weaponized by release of viable organisms in the air. Anthrax. It's caused by Bacillus anthracis. The spore form is highly resistant. Some remarkable data that um, sugar cubes that were used to feed horses in World War I have recently had anthrax, viable anthrax spores identified in them. That uh, much later. It's present in the soil in many areas. It's a naturally occurring uh, organism. Uh, it's uh, the cause of sporadic cases that are seen really throughout the world. In the United States, the, um, every few years, as I said, we get a case of anthrax that, uh, after investigation, is always attributable to exposure to a, a hide on a drum or, or something clear-cut like that. But we're talking about a case maybe every five years in the United States that's recognized. 
The genome and the uh, virulence plasmids have been sequenced. A lot of work was done with anthrax after the 9-11 attacks. But at that point, there had been 224 cases of cutaneous anthrax reported between 1944 and 1994, and none after that uh, until more recently, none after that up until the 2001 attacks. Only five cases were reported after 1981 and none since 1992, and all of those cases were cutaneous. Not that you saw, in the cutaneous cases in the uh, 2001 attack, they all survived. That's not the highly lethal version of this, and it's typically acquired through uh, occupational exposures. People who work with hides or drums could get cutaneous anthrax. Very, very rare, but they could get it. 18 cases of inhalational anthrax were reported in the 20th century period in the United States and none after 1944. It's a complicated slide. It just demonstrates, just focus on the top line there. <clears throat> it can enter through the skin, can enter through the GI tract, there's gastrointestinal anthrax, and it can enter through the lungs. <coughs> so cutaneous anthrax begins as a small pimple or a papule. By day two, there's a ring of small vesicles, which appears around that central papule. Uh, they are initially clear, but then they become hemorrhagic. By day three to four, this sort of beginning to get recognizable eschar forms, a very dark, deep, thick, black eschar that covers the area that had been vesicles. There's very little erythema around it. It's just a black eschar. Uh, it's very firmly adherent. Eventually, it, it falls off. So on the left, you see the anthrax eschar. And on your right, you see the bite of the re uh, brown recluse spider, which has been one of the illnesses that it sort of is uh, mimicked by. The difference is that's a very painful insect bite, and this is very uh, painless, suspiciously painless. And I must say, every time I give this talk or I talk to anybody about bioterrorism, I remember the summer of 2001 before the 9-11 attacks. We had a case at Elmhurst of a woman from Philippines who worked as a housekeeper in, in New York City who had a lesion that looked just like that. And we didn't culture anything from it. We saw the scab fall off. She recovered, we didn't make anything, we gave her some antibiotic or the other, and she recovered, but I've never seen it again. So since it was a few weeks before the September attacks, I've always wondered whether that was one of the victims. Anyway, the brown recluse spider is rare in New York City. It's more common in the rural areas around here, Connecticut, Long Island, but occasionally you'll see something that looks a little like anthrax. The key is that the anthrax is suspiciously painless. Okay, the infective dose is small. The average incubation period is anywhere from one day to 45 days. There's early flu-like symptoms, then late respiratory distress, sepsis syndromes, hemorrhagic mediastinitis, and mediastinal widening in a previously healthy patient who didn't have mediastinal widening is thought to be pathognomonic. That's what it looks like. Now, if you got a case today of a patient who came in with a fever and had that, I would defy any of us to come up with anthrax as the cause of that. Uh, even without all the arrows pointing to it, I think you can say, well, there's something in the mediastinum there, but, you know, who knows whether it's related to the acute illness or not. The treatment, Cipro or Doxy, are re reliably active. Uh, penicillin can be active if it's sensitive. Uh, the vaccination is an arduous process, requires five doses over a long period of time. Corticosteroids uh, for cutaneous anthrax or tracheal edema have been used. Uh, this is a little bit more about the vaccine with the recommended schedule at the bottom. It's a subcutaneous injection at 0 to 4 weeks, then 6, 12, and 18 months. This is what the military personnel go through. They are immunized to anthrax if they're going to be uh, sent to the Middle East or Afghanistan. So what's the level of risk of anthrax? Is the agent available? Yes, it's widely available. It's, it exists in nature. Uh, it's easily stored. As I mentioned, the an anthrax spores found on those sugar cubes from 100 years ago. You can tell how easily stored it is. Can it be weaponized? It's thought that 17 countries are experimenting with it as a biological weapon, including us. Uh, many, including the U.S., uh, uh, have, have done it, and including Iraq prior to the um, uh, 2002 invasion of Iraq. So I made up a slide like this on a several of the different infections we're going to talk about. So this is an early version of something you're going to see again in a few minutes. The health system challenges and the level of challenge, um, the ease of identification of victims, it's not easy. This is going to be, uh, if it's a fatal case of anthrax, it's going to be someone who comes in with a fulminant pneumonia and sepsis picture. And as you all know, we would come up with 10 other things before we would even begin to think about anthrax unless we were in the middle of an attack. 
the likelihood of transmission to healthcare workers would be minimal. This is not a person-to-person -person contagion problem. This is why um, many hospitals, including Mount Sinai after the 9-11 attacks, created a system where patients who were coming in in large numbers after an exposure to anthrax could have their clothes removed and their clothes either burned or washed or something because just washing the spores off is enough. Uh, the lethality, of course, is very high. The need for advanced PPE, there is no need for advanced PPE. The fear factor is very high, and it would be high again. If today there's an anthrax attack, there would be an anamnestic response uh, based on the 2001 uh, experience. And the ease of simulation, and this comes up in these exercises that we're always trying to plan, uh, exposure is easy. Actually, disease is hard. It's hard to emulate a disease that actually has to produce rapidly de um, destructive pneumonia and sepsis or a big necrotic lesion on the skin. But exposure would be easy to simulate. I'm involved in some of these plans for um, biological attack scenarios. We're working on one for HHC. And it can be very, very tricky because you, you identify the agents that you want everybody to think of. And then you have to basically eliminate all the other possibilities in the scenario. And that's very, very difficult with anthrax. OK, so let me mention some of the two of the national exercises that were done prior to the 2001 anthrax attacks. The dark winter exercise was a simulated release of smallpox in three states. Uh, the results of this, I won't go through all the scenario, I will for the other uh, exercise I mentioned next. But the leaders were unprepared. The way these exercises are done, by the way, is often patients are sent into emergency departments. That's what was done here. And the, leader, the governmental leaders are not informed that they're in the middle of a uh, simulated attack. They find that out within a few hours, but they're not informed initially. So the leaders were unprepared. The chain of command was unclear. Information on the number of cases, vaccine availability was not immediately known. Hospitals were overburdened by worried well. This is a phenomenon you've seen here. We've seen at Elmhurst. All kinds of uh, incidents have led to an influx of worried well, most recently the Ebola uh, cases. And that can be a crippling phenomenon in, in uh, big, busy hospitals. We don't have the space to evaluate and actually even place lots of worried well people. But that is a phenomenon that comes up in basically all these exercises. Within 13 days, the smallpox spread to 25 states and 15 countries. The projected number of cases by then was 16,000 cases and 1,000 deaths. So what were the lessons? A biological attack could threaten massive civilian casualties, violation of democratic processes, civil disorder, loss of confidence in government. You can imagine, imagine you're governor of um, you know, New Hampshire and you're told you have to keep people who've been exposed from leaving your state. What exactly do you do about that? The current organizational structures are not well suited and they remain not well suited for management of a biological attack. In the healthcare system, we're, we're very focused. We've limited the vast expanse of unfilled beds down to a very useful and typically used set of facilities. We don't have room for this sort of thing. Insufficient surge capacity is what that demonstrates. Dealing with the media would be a major immediate challenge. Let me tell all of you in the room today, you've probably been told this over and over again. If there's a media event here and you're approached by, uh, approached by a reporter, refer them to whoever is supposed to be speaking for the institution. Don't start giving your own account of what's happening. That has led to tremendous confusion, unnecessary fear, and it has tended to bog down the healthcare system, even in exercises. So should a contagious organism be used, the containment would represent tremendous logistical ob obstacles and ethical dilemmas as well. The top-off exercise. <clears throat> this was a $3 million drill. It was done to test the readiness of top government officials. That's how they got top-off to respond to terrorist attacks. There were three simulated attacks, chemical in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, nuclear in Washington, D.C., and biological in Denver. Let's talk about the biological attack. The agent used was Yersinia pestis, the plague bacillus, and was released as an aerosol. No advance warning was given. Again, this was a mock release. The exercise was conducted over a four-day period in 2000. An aerosol release of plague bacillus was covertly made in an unknown location in Denver. And then the modeling begins by the people who would say, okay, three days ago there was a release by this mechanism in an unknown location. This is how many cases would begin to be seen at which hospitals. So by three days later, 19 uh, local hospitals were uh, seeing a surge of patients with fever and cough. That would be how plague would present. Obviously, how many much more common things would present also. Uh, by the next day, 500 such patients had presented, 25 had died, and plague is confirmed. 
This is an organism that's not that difficult to identify. It's about the only advantage to plague. The governor moved to restrict travel. The governor is now aware of the scenario, and they're asked, well, okay, what would you do? And the governor of Colorado said, well, I'd restrict travel. But that was not a very effective thing to do. By the end of that same day, there were 783 cases, 123 were fatal, and it was determined that most of the cases had been at a concert at an indoor art center in Denver. This was the first time where the actual point of release was beginning to be characterized. Antibiotic shortages were reported by day four. Most hospitals were full, including with Worried Well. CDC push pack, which is this truck convoy of equipment and supplies, et cetera, arrives. Out-of-state cases are now reported, four days into the exercise. By the end of that day, 1,871 plague cases have occurred nationally with 389 deaths. Secondary spread of pneumonic plague, remember once this gets into the lung, it, you don't require a flea anymore. You can transmit it from person to person with this highly contagious bacteria. The Denver hospital system was overwhelmed with patients by this day, uh, day five. They were running out of antibiotics. Travel into and out of the state was now restricted, way too late for it to really be effective. By noon, 3,060 cases worldwide with 795 dead. So what were the lessons? Uh, there were over 4,000 cases of pneumonic plague worldwide with more than 2,000 deaths by the time the exercise was called, which was on day six. The antibiotic supply and distribution decisions came too late. Travel restrictions came too late. The hospitals exceeded their capacity within 24 hours. 80% of ER visits were by the worried well, and the outbreak control was not sufficiently prioritized. Again, I, I don't want to pound this point home too hard, but come on. If this was happening in New York State right now, it would be easily six days before anything approaching containment could be even be contemplated. You certainly couldn't restrict people from traveling out of the state, within the state, et cetera. This would be a, a, a genuine nightmare. So how are things any better now? What happened after the 9-11 anthrax release that actually protects us a little bit better? Well, the lines of authority are more clearly drawn. There are a lot of exercises. You've participated in them here at Sinai. We've done it citywide at our hospital, et cetera. There's a lot of discussion that goes on with this. But when something like Ebola surges comes and goes, Zika surges comes and doesn't go, we have other things that, that distract us from the biological attack scenarios. In fact, it's hard to tell them apart sometimes. Uh, decontamination facilities are getting better. Syndromic surveillance, this is something the city health department is pretty good at. They will check with hospitals several times a day to see if there's a cluster of suspicious sounding cases, like we just got five patients in the last two hours who seem to have pneumonia and we don't know what's causing it. We'll hear about that, but then it has to go to the next step, which is, okay, inform the entire city that Mount Sinai or Elmhurst has five cases that are suspicious pneumonia, do something. But at least that level of um, preparedness has been you know, uh, fortified. First responders are more familiar with the biological agents and scenarios, although we're talking about another generation of first responders since 9-11. And how familiar they actually are with what anthrax or plague looks like, I think you have to be kind of skeptical about that. So what are the resource needs? There has to be accurate risk reassess assessment, foolproof communications, mass surgeon, decon capacity, all of these things are, are next to impossible with our current healthcare system. There has to be easy access to personal protective equipment. As we learned with the Ebola outbreak, as you recall, there was one patient who came to the United States who had Ebola and no one knew it. There were, other pa there were nine others who came because they had Ebola, they were transferred. The one patient who came not knowing he had Ebola went to a hospital in Dallas he died and two nurses were infected, even knowing that he was coming from an Ebola epidemic area and gowning up the way they were instructed at the time they still got Ebola. That's kind of concerning. And that's an indication that even in the height of concern about something like Ebola was at that point, October two, um, two years ago, there was still that capacity to infect people who were exposed to patients outside of a pure containment facility. So in order to get somebody who's just been exposed as a random citizen to one of these frightening agents, if they're capable of communicating it, how do we get them into a containment facility promptly? Uh, enhanced lab capability, there's enhanced lab capability at hospitals like this one. Public health ha hospitals are more capable of identifying the organisms that are somewhat more difficult to identify. You still have to wonder about smallpox. Someone would have to begin that chain of concern and recognition in order to even reach a point of recognition and uh, proof. So what have we learned from naturally occurring emerging pathogens? Do this uh, for a few minutes and then we'll stop. <laughs> 
Okay, so H1N1. In the spring of 2009, there was uh, an out-of-season flu outbreak with a version of influenza, the H1N1 strain, that was similar to the 1918 strain that caused the global pandemic. So there was a tremendous amount of fear about this, and there was no vaccine. It took a couple of months for vaccine to be produced and distributed effectively against this, and it was out of flu season. So the ease of identifying victims was pretty high because it was not in flu season. If it had been in the middle of flu season, it wouldn't have been so easy to tell, okay, there's a different strain of flu now. The likelihood of transmission to healthcare workers was very high. Luckily, with influenza, it's all by the respiratory route, and a more elaborate means of containment were not really necessary. The lethality, thankfully, was low. The need for advanced PPE, personal protective equipment, there was no need for it. The fear factor, though, was extremely high. And the ease of simulation of this, it's been simulated again and again, influenza outbreaks of a novel strain. It's relatively easy to simulate this for exposure and disease. All you really need to do is say, uh, we have an actor who's going to have a fever and it's going to go into your, uh, your uh, emergency department in the setting where there are other cases of novel influenza around. It's not that hard. It may sound like it's hard, but compared to some of the other uh, organisms we've talked about, it's not that hard to simulate flu. Ebola. Ebola was a surprise outbreak. It occurred in West Africa for the first time in history. Ebola was kind of a novelty up until two years ago. It had occurred primarily in East Africa and South Africa with relatively small outbreaks in very remote areas. The biggest outbreak maybe had 500 people in it. Suddenly it was in West Africa. And we don't know exactly why that is. That's still trying to be worked out. The animal reservoir for it uh, is probably one of the several species of bats, probably. But that hasn't been confirmed either. All we know is that it was an exploding outbreak with a lot of deaths took a lot of resources to bring it under control again, and now we're down to occasional cases of Ebola in the three primary countries that were involved at that time, all in West Africa. Uh, it's kind of sobering to recognize what we went through with Ebola. That, that could be another one of those starting today someplace. We don't know. We don't have really an easy way of testing for it. We don't, even in a sophisticated environment like this, think of Ebola right off the bat unless we're in the middle of an outbreak somehow. But anyway, it was a very recognizable condition in those highly uh, affected areas. With um, hemorrhage was a major part of the illness for some patients, at least these hemorrhagic blebs. You see here, you see two of the patients who were evacuated to our country were known to be Ebola victims. They were evacuated here and treated here. Uh, Ebola in New York City. Of course, there was the, that gentleman up there is the man who went to Dallas. This is one of the nurses who got infected. That's Tom Frieden, director of the CDC, came under a lot of criticism for the perceived lack of preparation for dealing with Ebola in our country. Ebola in New York City in late uh, October 2014, there was the physician who'd been in uh, West Africa who arrived here, was under surveillance for early symptoms of Ebola, developed them, ended up getting uh, hospitalized at the Bellevue Containment Unit and eventually recovered from it. So big difference between the, this patient who came in not uh, under surveillance, not known to have been exposed to Ebola, who developed Ebola symptoms quickly and died here within a week and, and infected two nurses at a standard hospital facility, not a containment unit. And the, the physician in New York who was criticized for moving around the city a little bit, but basically was under surveillance, was moved to a containment facility promptly with the onset of symptoms. That was contained, no secondary cases, et cetera. But which is the more realistic scenario if Ebola were to come back? I suspect it's that scenario. And of course, the headlines, everything from whoops to uh, towels carry Ebola, to et cetera. Person of the year were all the people who uh, fought Ebola in uh, uh, West Africa. Training efforts were exhaustive, but they've slowed down a lot. For about a year, every month, we had key personnel, we probably had them here, who went through the training of actually putting on the personal protective equipment properly which had to cover every square inch of skin and had to be put on and taken off in a certain very uh, um, programmed order. Had to be under the observation of a trainer. That's basically gone out the window now. We do some video reminders of how that's done. We created a room at Elmhurst to put potential Ebola patients in where we could talk to them over the telephone without going into the room. And that's, you know, it's interesting historically, but whether it would be immediately applicable to a new case if an epidemic started again, you have to be a little bit concerned. It's nice that we went through that because we learned some lessons. 
But learning lessons from an experience doesn't always mean you're prepared for the next one immediately. This is a standard PPE type outfit that was recommended, covering every square inch, put on in a certain order. So Ebola. The ease of identifying, uh, uh, identification of victims would be high if we knew we were at risk. Wouldn't be so high if we didn't know we were at risk. The likelihood of transmission to healthcare workers is as high as high ever gets. Any skin contact with any body fluid seems to be a potential route of transmission. The lethality, of course, is high. About 40% uh, of the patients in Africa died. Uh, in this Western hospitals in Europe and the United States, it was more like 25% died, but incredibly high. Uh, the need for advanced PPE is very high. The fear factor is tremendous with Ebola, as we saw in this country. It do dominated the headlines. It froze everybody in place for weeks as it was unfolding in West Africa. The ease of simulation exposure is easy, and many simulated exercises have been done with, I was exposed to a patient who might have had Ebola, but mimicking the disease, of course, is much more difficult. Zika. Go back to this for a moment. The situation with Zika, by the way, is still unfolding. Um, the initial explosion of cases that appeared in Brazil, it's unclear whether that was quite the explosion that it's deemed to have been. There are a thousand pregnant women in our country who test positive for Zika who are currently under observation during their pregnancies. There have been a couple of children born with Zika-related congenital abnormalities. And we don't know where this is all going. The male infection syndrome, not well characterized. The risk of exposure following pregnancy, not well characterized. The, the testing for this disease, anybody who's been through this, if, if a patient is not symptomatic and they're beyond the first couple of weeks of potential exposure, testing is a very elaborate procedure. Uh, so we're facing something that's quite unusual. This virus, until about seven years ago, was not known to do any significant damage to the human race. Now, all of a sudden, there are global outbreaks. Southeast Asia, South Asia, Western Asia, the Pacific, our country, South America, all over the place. It's not clear exactly why that happened, whether the virus changed, our travel patterns changed, or something else is influencing this. But this is real. The microcephaly that Zika has caused has been confirmed as a result of Zika infection. And if you read the Zika literature that's coming out, it's getting scarier and scarier. All kinds of congenital abnormalities are seen. And abnormalities are seen even in some of the adults who've been infected as adults with this. So it's a frightening, exploding outbreak. Now, to some degree, it hasn't produced the level of visceral fear that Ebola did. Why? Because in our jobs as healthcare workers, we don't appear to be at much risk of this. Uh, but that may be a, um, an unfortunate decision. So the ease of identification of victims it's essentially impossible if they're asymptomatic. Uh, you can identify people who have a travel history that took them to areas where there may be Zika being transmitted, but identifying those who are infected, 80% of the victims of Zika are asymptomatic. The likelihood of transmission to healthcare workers is negligible, the lethality is low, the need for advanced PPE, not existent, the fear factor is extremely high among the general public, but not so much among us. So we see in these various examples, Ebola, Zika, H1N1, different configurations of our fear, the actual devastation that's being caused, the number of cases, where they are. And it, to me, we've gotten sort of a numb response to these things at this point, and, and almost automatically, because we can't be worried about every organism in the world and every potential route of transmission at all times. But as a result of that reality, we again and again miss the initial um, phase of these outbreaks or attacks. So this is my last slide. Um, how do you get really good at this? Well, I don't know anybody who's all that good at it, but this is a um, performance over instruction and experience in general. This is not specifically for this type of uh, problem, but the role of practice, expert performance, specialist, and uh, you know, for students and residents, you can gain some experience with this in a one you know, scenario exercise, but for those of us who are more responsible, um, you have to try to reach specialist level with this. At least be familiar with the common manifestations of these circulating diseases which are new. Uh, it's not that hard to be familiar with the common manifestations of chronic things, things that have been around for a long time, even acute infections that we're very familiar with, pneumococcal pneumonia. But these conditions represent a real challenge to us. And I don't know what to tell you to do about it, frankly. 
I think if you want to be involved in the response to bioterrorism, to biological attack by novel organisms, you have to make it a major focus of your career to stay involved with it. And I would encourage anybody here to participate in exercises, either online exercises or real life exercises. They're going on all the time. The city Health Department, the State Health Department is carrying these out. Read about them, read about the results, recognizing that all of us are going to be imperfect at, at uh, recognizing the initial phase of a new organism, a new attack. But we may be able to get to the point where we know we're dealing with something new. That may be all we can really do at this point. Okay, so I'll stop there and see if there are any questions. I don't, you know, as you know, Zika virus is the first virus that's ever been known to cause the types of fetal abnormalities that are being seen with it. Uh, so I think it's probably premature to even figure out what the attack um, age groups are going to be eventually with Zika. Because it's very recently that uh, they've now described in adults um, progressive brain damage from acute Zika infection. So I don't think we know the full picture yet. With Ebola, it's tempting to think it's got something to do with inherited immunity, but you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a mystery really with both of these because Ebola, if, if there's much childhood immunity to Ebola, where in the world did it come from? There was basically no Ebola to be exposed to until two years ago. And suddenly this age pattern we see. I mean, it may just be a, a manifestation of the, the white cell response to the infection may be different in, in children and adults. The bleeding tendency, what actually kills people may be more pronounced in adults for reasons we don't know yet. One of the concerns I have about Ebola is that although there's, there's certainly work going on now with finding treatments for it, all of the treatments that have been studied so far have failed. And there's a genuine steady loss of interest and enthusiasm for it because it's hard to study something when the disease doesn't exist anymore. So I think we're going to potentially never hear about Ebola again, but I think more likely we're going to see new outbreaks, new epidemics, and we're going to learn more sort of sequentially with those. But that's a long way of saying I don't know the answer to the question why children are relatively <laughs> resistant to some of the devastating complications. Any other questions? So uh, the knowledge of making genetic modifications is in open access journals. The uh, terrorists have been able to recruit smart people. Is there any evidence that any of these smart people have tried to weaponize any of these organisms because you can make them more lethal, you can make them more transmissible, and God knows there are volunteers to carry them wherever you want them to go. I know, it's a very frightening scenario, isn't it? I'm not aware of anybody who said, okay, this microbiologist has been involved in modifying this virus for this purpose, but there has been data on the number of members of the American College of Microbiology who are out in the world now, who potentially have this level of expertise. And frankly, the, the level of expertise does not have to be that great for weaponizing anthrax. Uh, you know? So I, I think the future is a long time, and I, I don't know what we're going to see next, but there's plenty of reason to be concerned that there are people who have the interest, the enthusiasm, the political motivation, and the facility to make these changes in organisms and make them more transmissible. I think one thing that we're going to find with Zika is after the dust settles on the current problem with it, there's going to be a lot of work on what exactly happened to this virus to turn it from a non-important pathogen at all, seven cases until seven years ago, to this global pandemic. There isn't a clear answer to that yet. Maybe we're going to find there was some human intervention with it. Who knows? But it's a very important question you're asking. Yeah. I, I actually served on an IOM committee that 
after 9-11 that looked at uh, biologic warfare agents. At that time, they told us there were 18 threat agents, which are defined by some evidence that they considered appropriate to judge them as having been weaponized by someone somewhere. Uh, we didn't go into all of the details. Uh, and obviously the issue came up as to whether or not you make 18 vaccines, especially given the challenges that you would know in terms of safety and testing and the fact that presumably no healthy people would ever, you know, need these. So the issue of who would pay for it and liability issues are monumental issues. One of the things, though, that I think started to emerge from our discussions was the potential role of passive immunization with monoclonal antibodies and therapy. And I was wondering if you wanted to comment on that, given the, 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 the improvement in that technology. I think for the, the organisms we're talking about, it's in its infancy or it's non-existent yet. I think it's an interesting strategy. I think, unfortunately, it's going to take more attacks in order for it to be pushed forward. As you know, a lot of this ultimately depends on the private market and what there is enthusiasm for. Uh, the military market and what and it's a very slow moving not very adaptable you know set of people who are involved in in decisions like that and i i think it's got some advantages i think these uh, framework vaccines where you simply plug in the new antigen on top of an established framework that elicits an immune response they hold some promise i think during our careers we're going to see some pr progress in that direction but what ebola says to me is if there isn't a crisis in front of us the work stops and that's unfortunate. Uh, and I, I think, you know, everybody would agree with that. And, you know, <laughs> thank you for pointing out the potential strategies. Thank you very much. On that okay. scary note, please go and make sure that you vote today. <laughs>